Good, so welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have uh, a fine array of people here and uh, more and more are coming all the time. Um, my name is John Bond and I think we'll just wait a few seconds to see if anyone else is, is coming and uh, make sure we've got as many as possible before we start. So let's start. Uh, so glad everyone can be here to join us. Um, here we are, and you can see the four of us, I hope. My name is John Bond. I am in Oxford in England. Uh, Sherto Gill is also in England. Um, Farai Magugu is in Zimbabwe, and Letlapa Mfalela is in South Africa. And I'll in introduce them a bit more before they speak. But uh, I regret to say that our, uh, our last speaker, um, we are sorry that Sandra Yeman is ill and so she cannot be with us. Sandra is the curator of discomfort at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. And her work looks to establish new narratives around social and economic inequality, gender equalities and colonial histories. So it's highly relevant, and, uh, but this is a continuing subject and we hope that Zandra will be able to join us in a forthcoming webinar. But this webinar is organized by Initiatives of Change International, a worldwide movement of people of diverse cultures and backgrounds who are working to transform society, starting with ourselves. Each of us can heed our conscience recognize where we fail to walk the talk, decide to change and take initiatives which build integrity and build trust across the divisions of our societies, the fundamentals of social development. We rely on donations to do this work and every gift, even a small one makes a big difference. And our website tells you more about our work and how you can contribute. And in the chat room, there's a link to the website and link to donate. So we appreciate any help you can give in that way. Now, just a few technical details. Uh, we are recording the session. Uh, so I hope everyone's happy with that. Uh, please keep your, your videos are actually turned off at the moment so that the focus is on the, the speakers. Um, uh, and, and audio is on mute and we'll keep that, but then we will move um, after uh, half an hour, 40 minutes to, to discussion. And so then, uh, uh, yes, all the way through, please put any questions you have, any comments in the chat, and that will be monitored and will be passed on to me. Uh, so um, then we'll make sure that, that uh, all who wish to contribute, as many as possible, will be able to contribute to the discussion. And we ask you to keep your contributions as short as possible so that as many people as possible can contribute. So the theme of this is colonialism. How is history catching up on us? And I think this is a crucial subject. History is catching up on the colonial countries. I believe that across the world, good governance and the democratic tradition is under threat from dictatorial methods of governance. The blindness of the colonizing nations to the harm we have done has helped this situation to grow. I come from Britain, a preeminent colonizer, and I've worked in many of Britain's former colonies. Colonialism changed the colonized countries for better and for worse. We British have been rewarded for whatever good we did by the wealth we have taken from our colonies. Today's challenge is to repair the damage we have done. The first step is to recognize the damage. I went to school in Scotland where I learned the glorious story of how we brought Christianity to our colonies, established legal structures, improved their infrastructure, developed democratic approaches. 
I spent the next 10 years in Africa and saw another side to this history. I learned about the slave trade, the Irish famine, the brutal suppression of Mau Mau in Kenya. My eyes were opened to the cruelty with which we British have often treated people in our colonial adventures. We may have forgotten, but they remember. An obvious example is China. Britain humiliated China in the Opium Wars, but has never apologized or taken steps to repair the damage we did. President Xi has used this humiliation as a powerful weapon in his drive for total power. He speaks about it constantly. We see what that has meant in Hong Kong, where democracy has been snuffed out. What, is it, what it has meant to the Uyghur people, half a million of whom are now in forced labor on cotton farms, exactly what African slaves were doing in the southern states of the USA in the 19th century. Now, I have seen the power of apology when it is backed up with a genuine attempt to repair the harm done. I spent 25 years in Australia and became the secretary of Australia's National Sorry Day Committee, which enlisted a million people in working for a national apology for cruel and misguided policies towards Aboriginal Australians. It took us 10 years of intense work, but we got there in 2008 when the whole parliament united in a wholehearted apology and put $5 billion into transforming the social conditions of Aboriginal Australia. So I know that change is possible, but it doesn't come easily. Here in Britain, we need to recognize that our empire has gone, but the attitudes it bred have not. The Windrush scandal shows how we cling to colonial attitudes. Meanwhile, $90 billion flows out of Africa each year illegally much of it going into British tax havens. If we wanted, we could expose this, but we benefit from it. So we leave Africa without the schools and clinics and industries that that money should be funding. Many in the rich world still grow rich on Africa's weak governance. Now, I believe our future will depend on whether the colonizing countries leave our former colonies to languish in poverty and poor governance, or we find a new determination to enable them to thrive. And I hope this webinar will help us all discover how to get involved and how to become more effective. So the first speaker is Letlapa Mfalele. Um, Letlapa was the operations <coughs> commander of the Azanian People's Liberation Army uh, in the struggle against apartheid. And then after the end of apartheid, he led the Pan-Africanist Congress in South Africa's parliament. And he has devoted himself to building understanding and trust across the deep divisions of South African society and also in other African countries. So over to you, Letlapa. Thanks so much, John. Good evening or good day or good night, everyone. My name is Letlapa Mpahlele. I'm a South African. I'm based in Johannesburg, although my village is up north in the northern province that is called Limpopo. Indeed, colonialism has had impact on most of us. It has shaped, rather influenced our lives. When I was born in 1960, there was governor general who was representing the Queen of England in South Africa let alone that things changed the following year. But growing up under such circumstances of a settler colonialism, I did not need a propagandist nor an agitator to see that things were not well. So age 17, I left the country and went into exile where I joined other freedom fighters. Well, I thought that I understood what freedom is, but because of mental damage that one grew up in, I took for granted that humanity is classified. They are superior and they are inferior beings within the human family. I'm saying this because one day we're playing a football match with Basara, 
known to the wider world as Bushmen. Being freedom fighters, we look down on them. We thought that we are superior than them. Now, fast forward that, uh, I came back and of course I struggled. And from the PAC ranks, we, we said uh, we are fighting against settler colonialism because uh, first they settled and of course that settlement was run concurrently with colonization. And as things stood then, uh, we adopted all methods of fighting. And one of them was the arms struggle, but it was the diplomatic, the economic isolation of South Africa, et cetera. I'm saying this because I realized that globally there were people who were not oppressed, but who were fighting or who were supporting the freedom struggle. I remember much as the PAC did not have wider support compared to the ANC, but there were organizations in the Nordic countries, they called themselves Azania support groups. And they used to help a lot in terms of printing our literature, which we distributed clandestinely in South Africa. And among other things, they used to send us supplies in the camps. Uh, I'm raising this because as we challenge the legacy of colonialism, which it is still there uh, in, in some parts of Africa, where as uh, I only learned uh, this week that uh, the outgoing president of the United States of America has actually recognized Morocco occupation of Western Sahara, Sahrawi People's Democratic Republic. And uh, these are other relics of colonialism on the African continent. And we do have another relic of, of colonialism uh, in what is called uh, Middle East or Western Asia, whereby uh, Palestine is still living under colonialism or under occupation. Lastly, as I am hearing a bell or a, something alerting me that I have exceeded my time uh, allotment. Uh, I, I, I think people who live in countries uh, which had colonized others, they have a duty not only to think about the slave owners, but to think about the slaves and their descendants. Uh, I'm told that for 200 years, the taxpayers of Britain were settling a debt uh, accrued during the times of slavery. Common sense would say that uh, 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 debt was towards the slaves or the descendants of the slave. Ironically, it was going to the uh, slavers or the slave owners. Much as we are working towards mental healing of colonialism, towards cultural healing of the scars of colonialism, but we must also think of economic healing because for me, it doesn't make sense that uh, it took 200 years, that is up to 2012 uh, for British taxpayer to pay slavers or slave owners. I thank you. Thank you very much, Letlapa. And now I would ask uh, Sherto to speak. Dr. Sherto Gill is a visiting research fellow at the Center for International Education at the University of Sussex in UK, where she teaches both masters and doctoral programs. And since 2018, she has been leading a UNESCO research project on mapping approaches to healing the wounds of history. Over to you, Sherto. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's such an honor to be joining this very important dialogue of our time. 
and my gratitude goes to the IFC's team for bringing forward this much needed conversation. I know I have very little time, but I still want to make an acknowledgement because um, before sharing my perspective on the topic, I want to acknowledge that the Gail Hermes Foundation for Peace, where I'm, 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 I'm a senior final and the executive secretary, um, our work on healing the wounds of history has very much been inspired by the initiatives of change is practice of forgiveness and reconciliation. One of our trustees, Alexandra Saley, had a spiritual receiving in 1997, which had led to her founding the Garden of Forgiveness in Beirut, a project equally supported by FC Lebanon. And since then, our team at the foundation has developed a Healing the Wounds of History program offered to communities torn by past atrocities in Lebanon, in Rwanda, and in countries in South America. And recently, I've started, like uh, John said, a work, I started working with UNESCO on the collective healing and an AFC colleague, and he's here in amongst us, Rob Cochran, is one of our advisors for the, for the UNESCO project. And he had been a great mentor to me. So I thought it's very important I take a minute to acknowledge all this. My talk will stress the historical and the collective nature of the legacies and harms of colonialism. Very much, I will very much echo what Lect have already put out there. So I will use transatlantic slave trade and slavery as a context to explore this. Well, let's just imagine 400 years ago, captives, um, cap captive Africans arrived at England's new colony in the present day Virginia, USA. By the way, um, Initiative Change had a fantastic trust building project in there. So these men and women had been kept uh, kidnapped from their home in Africa, forced to board ship and sailed months into the unknown, losing their friends and relatives to the horrendous voyage on the way. And then in the end, they were sold into forced labor. So their arrival is considered to be the beginning of century long transatlantic slave trade, a traumatic history continuing until today. Imagine what was it like? Filled with tragedy, pain, suffering, a legacy of dehumanization, inequality and oppression and so on. This is in, the, in addition to the continuous endurance, resilience and the survival, which is another story. But this is not the beginning of, of slave trade. In fact, throughout the 1500s, Portugal, Spain, Great Britain, France and, and the Netherlands had already enslaved African people. And although slavery existed, some people may say, oh, well, slavery has existed all through human history. But the scale and atrocity of transatlantic slave trade and the resulting enslavement of, of Africans took a new turn. It was permanent. It was a hereditary. It robbed all the enslaved, their human rights, human dignity. And also, that's with the beginning of tethering people of dark, darker skin tones to a diminished legal status. It was a inten an intentional process of turning human beings into commodity, like Lapa talk about the economic um, um, uh, compensation and economic healing. So turning human beings into commodity and instrumentalizing human body, black bodies in particular, as machines for the sole purpose of economic gains. So forced migration and the forced labor of, this, of the enslaved played a significant part in building the, Ameri the, the prosperity of Americas and also enriched Europe. Despite the resistance and so on, the legacy of a historical system of dehumanization remain with us today. That's the legacy of colonialism. Continuing colonizer like Lakdabapa already said, our body, our mind, our heart, our spirit, but also culture. The culture of formerly enslaved and their descendants. A key to this kind of colonization was the fabrication of race and the racial differences. Implying, Lakdabapa already highlighted, that being white is civilized, being black is barbaric, establishing white supremacy, superiority, and black inferiority, all later 
uh, col colonial conquest and colonial rule were this kind of logical outgrowth or logical consequences of this kind of self-appointed aggrandizing civ civilizing mission. It was almost embedded in the 19th century European anti-slavery rhetoric where the white Europeans sought to improve the moral and the material conditions of the existence of the native races. So here lies the binary of civilized and the barbaric. And this binary has been identified by many scholars to be underpinning the former co colonial countries' current foreign policies for international aids. Do you think about that? Likewise, countries who are committed to anti-racism causes now continue to favor legal regimes and policies and policing um, practice that promote systemic in, um, dehumanization. Now today, 500 years later, after the first enslaved Africans were brought to the Atlantic shores, the trauma and the wounds of slavery and the harmful effects of colonization remain to be far reaching. The pain and suffering not limited to the physical psychological harm we talk about descendants of the formerly enslaved they are equally experienced as a collective trauma within the overall institutionalized racism the toxin of which has contaminated i think across the global societies consequently violence and dehumanizing within our socio-economic political system has sustained the atrocity of, the, of, of, of colonialism, ensuring the continued exclusion of people of African descent from full participation of citizenships, such as fair access to education, employment, and so on and so forth. Um, so without healing the wounds left by the slave trade and slavery, structural racism will only reinforce the prolonged trauma and continued damage. Now, in most recent years, thanks to um, research such as the ep epigenetics, we now recognize that the human dehumanizing effect can be transferred to successes, successive uh, generations, not only in, as personal trauma, but as a collective and cultural trauma that may define who we are, our values, meaning and worldview. Additionally, it is also increasingly acknowledged like Lava already highlighted, the historical legacy of colonialism has equally destructive impact on the communities of victimizers and benefactors. The psychic structure is transmitted intergenerationally, intergener but also horizontally through a collective unconsciousness. Research has shown that distorted psychic structure demands white people in the US to actively resist and prevent themselves from making contact with people of African descent and from showing interest in their racialized realities out of fear and guilt. In, in turn, fear and guilt, although unconscious, are symptoms of trauma. So this suggests that when humans are, treating, are treated inhumanely, such as the, 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 the slave, descendant of slave, and humans treating other people inhumanly, such as the, 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 what's have done in, by the European, we are equally traumatized and dehumanized. Hence, we want to stress the imperative for collective healing, which must be a shared human responsibility. Without collective healing, there cannot be a collective future. I think my time is up, John. So what I'll do is I'll leave the UNESCO collaboration, how we approach healing and collective healing and what we have defined in terms of the different process of healing to the next round of conversation. Good, <clears throat> good, thank you so much. Well, you've put a huge amount into that nine minutes. Thank you. And I hope that people will, they're starting, I see, to put things into the chat. Please do put comments, questions, and so on, and then we'll, we'll launch into them when we have a time of discussion. But before we do that, I'd like to ask Farai, Farai Muguru to speak. Farai is devoted to improving the governance of natural resources in Zimbabwe, um, which has cost him a lot, 
prison sentences. Um, and uh, he has been awarded international awards for his courage in challenging corruption and human rights abuses. Uh, he founded the Center for Natural Resource, Resource Governance in 2012, which researches and documents human rights abuses and seeks to halt illicit trade in minerals. Over to you, Farai. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you, uh, the previous speakers. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about Zimbabwe and of course, generally I wonder um, throughout the continent, but uh, Zimbabwe was under British colonial rule for 90 years from 1890 to 1980. Throughout the 90 years of colonial rule, a lot of things happened and uh, the subject of colonialism actually triggers very mixed feelings among the Zimbabwean people. If such a discussion was held in 1980, I think there would be 99% agreement that the colonialism was evil. But if it's held today, I think there will be a very disputed debate as to the legacy of colonialism and that it left behind very good infrastructure. It put the country um, on a certain level where I had we built from that, we would be at a very advanced stage in terms of modern states. However, during the 90 years of colonialism, there was continuous alienation of the Zimbabwean people from their land. Land was taken away right from 1980 and people were bundled into uh, the so-called reserves uh, where people would live in sets of fly infested areas, rocky, dry land, which could not sustain subsistence agriculture. Um, however, resilience was built as people tried to survive and uh, make lemonade out of the lemons that were thrown at them um, until the, the, the armed struggle was waged to get rid of colonial rule. But uh, that armed struggle itself created its own contradictions. And I would say that colonialism created a leadership vacuum in Zimbabwe and the entire African continent where throughout the colonial era, the indigenous people were not given opportunities to exercise and develop leadership skills. So only the brave, those who could do the unthinkable, who risked their lives to go to fight, got the ticket to be in government. So there we are in 1980, we've attained our independence we are led by people who never ran a company. They never governed. They were never in a leadership position, but because they managed to fight, they managed to hold the gun. Um, they acquired the power to, to, to rule. That's how people like Robert Mugabe, the current president, Emerson Munangagwa, became leaders. It was through participation in the war. Um, I can also add to say, Colonialism created a breed of wounded leaders. The struggle for independence itself left indelible wounds on the people who finally liberated their countries. And because of the wounds they are carrying, they are like a, a, a wounded tiger, such that they are a danger to their own people um, this brings us to the subject of the human rights record of liberation regimes, whereby um, sometimes they are even more brutal than the colonial regimes, mainly because of that's the leadership skills they acquired during the war, that you need to enforce discipline. Um, uh, the, the leader is a messiah. It is something, someone who must be worshipped. Um, and against this, the Western countries, when they withdrew from Africa, they also imposed the 
uh, kind of elections. And uh, as a result, we have many de facto one party states in Africa where constitutionally you've got multi party democracy, but in reality, in fact, it's a one party state that is allowed to rule. Elections are a charade. They are meant to tick boxes, to gain legitimacy, to gain acceptance in the West, to access um, loans from IMF, the World Bank. Just some interesting statistics here. We just had an election in Tanzania. The incumbent, John Magufuli, he got 84.4% of the votes. That's a miracle. In Cote d'Ivoire, Alassane Ouattara, he got 95.3% of the vote. That's a great miracle. In Uganda, you've got Museveni who keeps on throwing the opposition in jail. These are the contradictions we have where the continent is being decolonized, but those who colonized us, uh, those who liberated us have become the new colonial masters. Um, there's also the issue of economic imperialism that our leaders have become gatekeepers of foreign interests. They are not serving the interests of the African people, the people they lead. They are there to transact with foreign alliances, foreign syndicates. China is becoming a new imperial power. Um, Africa has got a lot of resources which can attend to our industrial needs. Uh, food security and everything that we want. But all these resources are saving foreign interests and not the interests of the African people. Now, what should be done? Number one, there is the need for acknowledgement that colonialism um, deprived Africa of the chance to develop itself. Number two, there is need for awareness raising, especially in the Western world of what colonialism did to the African people. Um, sometimes when I go to Europe, I feel like I'm charged guilty the moment I emerge out of the airport. The moment they see me, they see a criminal. Even if I'm coming in a crowd of more than 100 people, the moment they see me, I'm told to come out of the group and, and, and be searched and be interrogated. Number three, there is need for reparations. In Zimbabwe, throughout the country, we have pits left by the Germans. They were digging for gold everywhere in the country. They did not build a single road, a single railway. They took all the gold to Germany. And I believe there is a need for reparations, some um, retaining of the stolen wealth. And how is colonialism catching up with us? Migration. Migration is very much linked to the colonial footprint in Africa, where colonialism failed to develop leaders, um, left a leadership vacuum, and the leaders we have are mercenaries, they are gatekeepers, and people want to survive, they want to live, they want to pursue their dreams, and that's why everybody wants to go to Europe. In Zimbabwe, we have so many graduation ceremonies every year, and every graduate want to catch the next bus, the next flight to Europe, because there is no hope on the continent. And so I would want to say that uh, the situation in Africa um, is a global pandemic in a social, uh, political economy uh, sense. Unless the whole world unite to say, Let's work together to cure the sickness that was created by colonialism. I think more Africans are going to leave their countries and, and become anything else anywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Farai. Well, there's a frank and, and straightforward challenge to us and to everyone in Africa, in Europe, and across the world. Um, shall we now just have a moment of quiet and gather our thoughts, because this launches us into a discussion which I hope can be practical.
Um, what are we doing? What can we do? What is needed to make things different? We can, it's, 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 it's a tough challenge, but if we want to preserve our own freedom, democracy, uh, good governance, this is all part of it, part of healing the wounds of the past. We cannot turn away from it. So uh, let's be quiet for a minute or so. Well, I hope our, our um, speakers also are just having a look at the chat, just to make sure you're aware of different questions coming in. Um, but but let me uh, let me mention a few, and and I won't just have. Uh, I'll ask. Uh, I'll mention one or two at the same time because uh, then we can have more of a discussion. Um, and uh, I, I hope that people. Yes, we, we're now able to to. Um, if you are wanting to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. Um, so that so that we can hear people's voices and asking their questions, uh, questions or comments. Uh, so let's let's have one or two. Um, I see that uh, uh, Rob Corcoran, you have something. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, no, I was interested in what Los Lapa said, and Sherto also referred to this in some way. Uh, about your own experience of uh, internalized oppression and how you recognize that you had yourself internalized some of the uh, racial hierarchy uh, imposed by the colonizers. And I'm wondering how you have overcome that or how, how you continue to overcome that. Nice, nice to see you, Latlapa. Oh, hi. Uh, I'll just, Latlapa, I'll just ask another question. Um, to, okay. I'll, ask, I'll ask Mike Smith <clears throat> to put your question in as well. Mike, could you say what you'd like to know? Um, thank you for all of the speakers. Um, I want to ask um, Dr. Gill particularly, um, what role does forgiveness, both the seeking and offering of it play in healing history? Or, or can that too easily let some of us off the hook that shouldn't be too easily let off, let, let off the hook? And secondly, what role does the teaching of history play in understanding the, the history of the slave trade and its legacy? In, in the UK, all we learn about is the, is the six wives of Henry VIII, and that's about it in teaching history. Um, but we're not taught about um, the appalling horrors and suffering of the slave trade at all in our history lessons. Uh, thank you. And now let's have a third one. I think, um, Adamar, would you like to put something in? Yes, I have, uh, I have written here a comment uh, about Brazilian history because we have the difference between the past and the present. I think I may read the, what I have written, may I? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Brazil, having been colonized, by, we were colonized by Portugal. We were one of the last country to abolish slavery. And despite being a mixed race country, we still, we, we still, uh, Brazil is still a very racist country towards the black and the indigenous people. And we have the modern labor slavery towards the Bolivians and people from other neighbors and the refugees. We have many Africans refugees in Brazil and they have to be submitted to uh, low payment jobs. That's the modern slavery in Brazil. Our extreme right government denies the racism and the need for healing, okay? Especially towards the black people and the indigenous and the women, black women people. Me as a teacher, I as a teacher, I have been trying to awake awareness uh, to my students who feel inferior for being black and from poor community. I have tried to make them think that they are very important and they are young people and they can be the change of our countries. So uh, that's uh, so 
uh, if anyone would like to make the comments about the modern slavery trade, you know, because we have the the modern slave uh, submitted uh, people submitted to low bad conditions of uh, work work conditions. If you understand me, that's yeah. the situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, now John Carlyle says it will be good to see participants' faces. We didn't see Adamar's face. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry. No, uh, no. No, no, it's not your fault. Um, at least I don't think it is. I'm just thinking that maybe it's better to see everyone's face during our now discussion time. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't turn on my video. Sorry. No, no, you can't. You can't. You're, you're forbidden uh -huh. from doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. just, I'm just suggesting to our technical people in the background that maybe we can see everyone now. And then, and then, if you put your view on speaker, then of course, when the speaker speaks, you'll see that person. Um, so, uh, if, if that's possible, uh, Elena or Olga, please feel free to turn us into seeing everyone. But now, uh, the, the several things have now been raised in these different questions and comments, um, which are all highly relevant to what we're dealing with. Because, as I say, I hope we can be practical. And what Adamar said is what he's doing as a teacher trying to help people who suffer from the colonial attitudes and help them feel that they are important. Then there's the question which has been given to you, Letlapa. Anyway, may I ask perhaps Letlapa would start, would you like to start first, Letlapa? No problem. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's an ongoing struggle that is, uh, is something that daily I have to face because if you wake me in the middle of the night uh, and invite me to watch a boxing match and they say white boxer and a black boxer instantly i'm going to root for the black boxer and it happens even at the level of uh, game uh, for instance when the protea the south african cricket side plays the West Indies. Instinctively, I root for the West Indies because the South African side will have one or two black faces and the West Indies will have the whole squad, they will be black. And uh, actually a friend of mine, we're together in the camp, uh, currently I think is a uh, major general in the South African National Defense Force. Uh, is a great fan of the Springboks, the South African rugby side. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to meet him and ask him, how did he overcome that? Because I'm still struggling. I'm trying to buy South African uh, Springboks uh, regalia, caps, T-shirts, and everything to overcome the prejudice that I have towards them. Uh, but I, I, I'm not winning. I'm going to ask him how has he uh, developed, you know, uh, from being an Abla, uh, anti-establishment guerrilla, to be a great fan of the Springbok. So it's a struggle that is ongoing. But of course, there's another thing. Uh, if I were to undergo a, a major heart surgery, and there are two doctors, a black doctor and a white doctor. Instinctively, I feel that I have greater chances of surviving the major operation if the doctor is white. It happens even when I fly, when I fly in Europe, even through the West Tabulet, uh, I feel relatively safer than one day I was uh, flying from uh, Juba, the capital city of South Sudan, to. Uh, to uh, Nairobi and route to, to Johannesburg. The weather was terrible and the pilot was black, pitch black, and, and so was the co-pilot and so was everyone in the cockpit. I, I, I felt less, you know, safe. So these are something that, that I have to fight, you know, every day uh, because 
that negative attitude that is internalized towards my own color. If I walk in, in the night and I, I, I see a black person, uh, I, 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 I think that my life is in danger. But if I see a, th a, a, black, a white person, I said, no, I don't think he'll be fighting. So this is something really that uh, one has to contend with daily. Thanks. Thank you. Now, uh, Sherta, you were asked something directly. Um, yes, I was asked, um, uh, Mike asked me two questions. One is about um, forgiveness, one is about um, history education. Um, but also I've been reading through the um, comments on the chats and different people were, were um, reflecting our, our, our own questions about the different way of con conceptualizing slavery and um, colonialism and also healing. And as a thought, um, John, with your permission, I'll just quickly uh, talk about um, within the UNESCO um, um, healing program, how we perceive healing. How do we see that healing can happen at a different level in doing this? And I, then I can come and address um, um, Mike's question and other people's question in terms of uh, whether, why we didn't cover so the, you know, Arab slavery and, and also the, the fact that the slavery has been going on for a long time. Would that be okay? Yes. Okay, so I've just very briefly, and UNESCO has a project called the Slave Root Project. And it's, it was established in 1997. And they want to rec the project recognize the kind of the, 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 the trauma of transatlantic slave trade and slavery, but also recognize the importance of healing. So we joined the pro program in 2018. And we, we did two projects so far. The third is in the, on the way. The first one was to conceptualize. Robert was, Rob Cochran was our advisor. So the first one was really conceptualize wounding, collective wounding and, and, and healing. And so wounding is connected to dehumanization. When we are treated not as human beings, our intrinsic value has been violated and our dignity has been taken away. And that constitutes wounding, that constitutes a trauma. And this trauma um, and can be done in many ways, but when you actually, the whole people, a whole culture has been treated dehumanized and that constitutes a collective trauma. And so healing, when you look at healing, healing is not actually just putting things back, but healing, has to happen at four levels. We identify four levels. The first level is has to be directed as that the acts of dehumanization, the very acts such as inflicting pain and, 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 and colonize, colonialism is, is that dehumanizing act. And because to, to heal that, that has to involve, because some of the questions say, what do we do? Public acknowledgement, uh, um, apology, uh, which can be accepted, uh, can be accompanied by genuine expression of atonement, commitment to reparation, and also state initiated the process of a truth and reconciliation, and national leadership dedicated to finance or the participation of people from, from both sides of the trauma. Uh, these are the essential for this process of directing at, 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 at the humanizing act as such. The second process has to be directed in the traumatic effect. People feel diminished, people feel dehumanized, the people feel traumatized. So what, what can be done? There are lots of activities such as remembering, commemorating, making sense of the trauma and separating our, our own personhood identity from the effect of trauma. Otherwise, our identity will be defined by trauma and therefore, thereby perpetuating that separation, hatred and so on and so forth. And then reconnecting from that angle to reconnect to our, our human dignity, restoring human spirit and our sense of wholeness, both as an individual human being, but also a, as a humanity. So the third process we, we, we looked at was directed as those dehumanized relationships. So relationship is actually what we're experiencing now. 
even just our economic per socioeconomic purpose, even it's our ac lack of access to public health system and so on. These all can also be connected to that dehumanizing relationship because it highlights the rich array. Now here there are rich array uh, approaches and Rob Cochran's trust building initially in Virginia, now uh, uh, spreading around the world, involves those transcending bin binaries, reaffirming narratives, meaningful narratives, and uh, forgiveness. I would come back to that, Mike. Uh, uh, reconciliation, trust building, but also most importantly, co-action. It's in doing things together within the community, then we re restore the relationship. And we also have Jill Berry here, who has worked in Northern Ireland There's many, many different kind of processes. There are lots of good practice. But we also add for the UNESCO project of one final dimension, that is the structural dimension of healing. We touch it upon by, by Farre and, and also Black Lapa. And this is the structure aspect of healing, really important, because without this, without education, without legislative reform, without economic culture of economic institutions becoming more dehumanizing and caring, without our public system and systems becoming equal and fair, there can't be, there can't be healing. So healing is, almost, the systemic dimension of healing is important. Now, so if these are the, yeah, so if these process constitute collective healing and so on. So where is the place of forgiveness? Mike, I think of forgiveness, I, I remember very clearly um, Imad is, is here. Imad and, and um, the, the founder of uh, Forgiveness Project, um, um, Marina Content Casino, we were sitting in a conference that I facilitated and I asked the question. I said, on the one side is Hamna Rent. A, 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 a view of forgiveness that that there are certain things just unforgivable, such as the Holocaust, such as the, the, the kind of the 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 the, 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 the um, genocide involved in the in the colonialism, and the other side is Jacques Derrida's view. Jacques Derrida's view is forgiveness only applies to what is unforgivable. So what do you see this? And um, I think you might have seen something, I don't know what he thinks, but it is what is the point here is forgiveness is indispensable in a world torn by all sorts of wrongdoings at both individual level and a collective level, as also at our inner level, inner world, equally torn by the moral wrongs as we inflicted on others or have inflicted on us. So on this backdrop is this understanding of the being human itself. We are imperfect beings. We, by being human, we already had this kind of the moral dilemmas we have to deal with and so on. And therefore, it is precisely on this backdrop, our moral obligation as human agents and our inalienable rights and the need for healing, for dignity, healing, reconciliation, peace and well-being. This is where for, uh, forgiveness has a place. It does not necessary to let other people off the hook but by forgiving them, forgiving, say, you know, the European descent, people of the European descent who participate in slavery and so on, by forgiving, we actually give them permission to put the wrong right, put the wrong right. Thank you. Very Sorry, much. I didn't I didn't say anything about the history of education. And we'll probably talk about well, it another time. Run, because thank you very much, because that's that contains a huge amount, because healing, healing is is crucial. And uh, thank you for your emphasis on that. Um, Farai, would you like to put anything at, at this point? Uh, are you muted? Yes, you're muted at the moment, Farai. Thanks, John. Not really, unless there's any question directed at me. Okay. Well, now here's a Zimbabwean young person asking Farai about natural resource exploitation. Uh, blessing. Can you unmute yourself and uh, ask? Okay. Hi. Farai. Hi, blessing. Uh, it's good to see another fellow Zimbabwean talking about this. Um, I, I, I agree with everything you've said about 
colonization and how it has affected the leadership. And it, it's sad that the way leadership was shown during colonization was, was more of master and slave and that it became now the leadership formation for our leaders. That um, I'm, I also got to learn that uh, besides um, the allies, which our country has in exploiting our natural resources, I didn't know that it also involved um, Western countries, but uh, the main one which has been said in Zimbabwe, it involves China. And I know that China has helped us in, in other ways, but when it comes to the mines, you'll find that in Shurugi and other parts that uh, people are falling into these mine ditches and then they get some sort of form of disabilities. And you'll find educated people, a headmaster, a teacher going there to mine because they, sorry, I'm getting emotional at the same time, but you end up finding them there because they're saying 30 US dollars isn't enough for their pay. Then uh, young people as well. So I'm asking how best I can do a research on it because um, I do have an organization, I'm still starting it and registration has just been delaying, but I was hoping to know how best I can go about it. Though I know that it's quite a sensitive topic because I might be told that, okay, you're crossing in the wrong line. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's just that young people like us that you get a degree and you can't even use your degree because you're being told there are no jobs. And I do have a degree a Bachelor of Social Science degree in Environmental Studies, and I haven't gotten to use it exactly, sort of, because I've been just doing voluntary work. So my question is, how best can I go about it, but at the same time, um, making sure that people get an awareness that in as much as you might be desperate to get, and uh, you might want to earn a living, it's quite dangerous to do these mining activities because it puts your health at risk. I don't know if I've Thank made you. my question sense. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Let me just, let me just uh, Farai, I'll just bring in some others as well so people can be thinking about them, but then I'll come back to you to answer. But Ken, would you like to just put in your question? Ken Noble? Yes, um, I'm very conscious that you know, I come from a country which has a long history of exploiting other countries. And um, there's been quite a lot said about how traumatizing it is for the people who were colonized and the legacy of that. But I just wondered if there'd been any study about the effect it has on the colonizing power and the slave owners and the slave traders and all those who, in a sense, were the perpetrators of the injustice. Thank you. And then uh, um, Dr. Afaf Badran, uh, do you want to put in your question? Y yes, well, I did. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. You? Okay, very good. Uh, I, was, uh, I was just asking because uh, uh, we started with the colonization or colonialism, and then we, we talked about slavery in general, and then uh, to black slavery. And I was wondering if there was uh, any sort of serious study about how it started and, uh, and uh, how it developed. Also, uh, the other aspects of colonialism have not taken their, their, their due attention in this discussion. And uh, just one thought that I would like to, to share. When I looked into the Egyptian history, and that is that uh, like 250 years ago, be, uh, sorry, before Christ, BC, um, we had the kings of Egypt. They were dark. They were from Nubia and South Egypt. And, uh, and you can see that from the paintings and, it, and from the different features. And uh, there, was, there was no discrimination at that time because the kings were dark and and uh, their wives even sometimes were fair. So uh, that brings me to question. I mean, 
the, the, this is the old kingdom in the time of the pyramids when the pyramids were built. So how, how, when did slavery develop? It's just a question that I need, uh, you know, to have uh, more uh, perhaps references to understand how this developed. Thank you very much. Well, there you are. There's some new points which uh, any of you may wish to answer. But first, uh, Farai, would you like to? Thank respond? you very much, uh, uh, John. Uh, blessing. Uh, thanks for your question. Mining in general has become a, a threat to national security in Zimbabwe. Um, it is now a part of widespread transnational organized crime where we are getting a lot of international syndicates who are working with Zimbabwe's ruling elites uh, to extract uh, minerals and illicitly siphon them out of the country. And China has become a very big player since 2001 when uh, the EU and the United States uh, imposed the uh, travel restrictions on Zimbabwe's uh, ruling elites. So what we are seeing is that they are digging pits everywhere in the country. There is this contestation between mining and agriculture where mining is now threatening food security. They are digging everywhere. They are taking people's fields and the government is supporting that. Uh, I'll just give you an example of what happened the last month outside the military at a farm called the Premier, where the government contracted a Belarusian company to do alluvial gold mining. That Belarusian company then subcontracted a Chinese company which was already operating in Zimbabwe. But the area they were going to mine already had scores of artisanal miners who were working underground for several months now. And the Chinese company went on to fill the, uh, the shaft leading to the underground tunnels with, the, with, the, with earth and deliberately suffocating about 12 artisanal miners to death. They only retrieved the two bodies and the rest, they were left there to rot and they will never be recovered. So that's how mining is manifesting in, in, in present day uh, Zimbabwe. With regard to research, it's very important. I think the subject is under-researched. I'll give you also my contact number so that we can engage bilaterally uh, on, <clears throat> on, on how best you can go about your research, I think. We, we need a bit of a longer uh, conversation on that one. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. <clears throat> now, Sherto or Latlapa, um, would you like, the, there were questions about the, the origins of slavery, the impact on slave traders, uh, Sherto or Latlapa or, or Farai, would you like to respond in some way to those? I'll say a few words, and others will will um, um, surely will will continue. Um, and a, a typical um, a typical argument about the um, the scale of um, the, the transatlantic slave trade um, um, is is this. Well, slavery has been in. I mentioned it already, and then Rob also answered it. Um, slavery has been in humanity forever, from Romans and Greeks, and probably even even earlier than that. Um, humans have enslaved each other, but um, as I said, the transatlantic slave trade has has taken it to a, a, a different turn. Um, the reason is a lot of uh, what um, and in, throughout human history, war tend to use. Um, the captives uh, or the, the defeated part to as people as as slaves and or use them as labor forced labor and so on um but this is just a this is a part of, of a conquerors and um, um, um the victors kind of practice but what really underpin the transatlantic slave trade is this um mass scale of dehumanization the dehumanization is treating these people at at tools and and as as machines and 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 so there is a whole social engineering in reaching that so first of all it's as i said the discourse of race 
the race is a social construct. In order to make it possible, we have to create a, a racial discourse. And so this is the first one. And also religion had played a part in, some, in, in de defining those people as inferior. And, 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 and there is a whole institution built, legal system put into place. And Rob said, they put the people, these people in, in enslavement, in perpetuity, because they are, uh, there is, they, it's become hereditary. You and your, 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 your children and children's children, all these become property objects, property of some, some of the slave owners. It's this nature of dehumanization and the nature of atrocity and also the violence, a characterization of this is just unheard of throughout. The, by, be it the Arab slavery, be it the um, early slavery that's due to, due to war and so on. And so that's, that's one aspect. The other thing is, is um, the way we use these people, you know, in, 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 in some of the um, um, banana sort of an economy and, and it's, what, what they say is these people's shelf life is seven years. Can you imagine human being has been set with lives and our a whole richness of life has be, have become shelf life. It's worse than our, the way we talk about the washing machine. And so let's squeeze every last bit out of them before they expire. And this way of seeing other human being, unless you as our, ourselves are dehumanized, is almost unfathomable that a human being would treat another human being in this way without those prepared social engineering in place discourse, brainwash, mentality, and so on. This will not be, this scale of, of dehumanization will not be possible. And that's why this wound is collective. It's everybody's wound. It's everybody's responsibility to think that they're just between them and them. Then we are, we are actually colluding with the system. All of us, whether we participated. Okay, so I was in, 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 in a meeting in Virginia and um, so on the one side is all black people of darker skin. On the other side is people of, of pale skin. And I'm standing in the middle. You know, who the hell are you? You are here. What are you doing? Are you Japanese? Are you, 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 you suffered from, 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 from some kind of a, 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 um, um, a trauma. So that's why you're here. But I said, I'm here because what's happening in history is everyone's bloody business. It's everyone's business. We cannot just say, oh, I, I, I have, I'm from nomadic, nomadic background. I have nothing to do with this. And that is actually supporting the whole system. So we must be clear that all of us, including our own healing, including our own searching, including our own relationship with race, with color, with, with where we're standing, there is no bystander. We're all involved. The fact that, that we are living a comfortable life is owing to that history. So that history cannot be reduced to old human slavery practice. The modern slavery practice is not excusable. We must do something about it. But we have to recognize that this root, this, this moment when humanity realized sugar is worth more than the whole shape of Africans' life. That is not acceptable. We must remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a good moment, I think, to stop for a moment and think, because these are big issues that we are dealing with. And yet we all have a part. And uh, as, as Sherto says, we are all involved in this. So how about we just stop for a moment of quiet and then we have another 15 minutes before we finish. Um, just think, what am I, how can I contribute in however small a way to healing the wounds of, in this issue of colonialism, um, in building a better society? What am I gonna do? And then if anyone wishes to share, please do, including our speakers. Thank you, let's just wait. Be quiet for a minute.
I know there are some people such as, I see Roger Spooner there, who's devoted himself to healing the wounds resulting from Britain's mandate in Israel-Palestine. And uh, which yeah. is making a considerable impact on Britain. Yeah, I, yes, well, can you, can you hear me? Um, I, I, I would, I think education is incredibly important. Um, and we've been looking at Israel-Palestine. I mean, Britain offered an Arab state, including Palestine, in 1915, offered support for an Arab state, including Palestine, in 1915, the McMahon Hussein correspondence. In, 19, 19, in 1917, they offered to set up a homeland for the Jews, and we failed to keep that first promise. If you ask anybody, virtually anybody, 99.9% .9 of the people in the United Kingdom, they'll have never heard of the McMahon Hussein correspondence. And that's... Um, there's a, I, an interesting quote, actually, about from a writer called William Dalrymple in, in Britain, and he was he was talking after David Cameron, had, our prime minister, had just been to Amritsar, in, and whether the British massacred a lot of people back in 1919, and he did not apologize for that. And what this uh, Dalrymple was saying that what Cameron can do, however, he, he, Dalrymple was not sure about apology, but he, what he did say, what Cameron can do, however, if he feels real contrition for Britain's past, is to make the teaching of the British Empire a compulsory part of the GCSE history syllabus. The empire was, for better or worse, the most important thing the British ever did. It completely changed the shape of the modern world. Yet most British people are, by and large, completely unaware of the details of their imperial history. My own children learned Tudors and the Nazis over and again in history class, but never came across a whiff of Indian history. I should say he lives in India. This means that they, like most people who go through the British education system, are wholly ill-equipped to judge either the good or the bad in what we did to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Anyway, uh, Roger and his wife are two who are doing something about that by launching the Balfour Project, which you can look at, look, discover what it is on the internet. Um, now I see some people still asking, um, uh, uh, I think Spencer Brown asking, would you like to speak, Spencer? Yes, just rapidly, and, and perhaps a question towards Farai. Uh, in, in present day, dealing in South Africa with the rest of the world, how does the legacy of colonialism still express itself? And I, I'll just give you, give you give a parallel from Australia, where recently this company, Rio Tinto, uh, saw that if they blew up a 40,000-year-old Aboriginal heritage site with Aboriginal art, they could get 800... No, they could get $80 million worth of iron ore to sell... To China. And so they blew up this site. They may end up paying a penal penalty of 250 million. That's what I saw. Because, but, but the point is, what I, what I want to say is, the first director of Rio was actually someone who is very sensitive to Aboriginal heritage. And he was replaced by another director, someone brought up in good French economic school, whose only concern was to get the maximum amount of money out of their mining operations. And the, but here I'm talking about a colonial attitude in 
2020, because this is a company that's registered on the London Stock Exchange. And there's, there's obviously so many examples like this, the, the big French companies working in the Cameroons and all this, where uh, they are stripping countries of tremendous resources and making sure that the press and ordinary citizens do not have a voice to say to exert any counter, counter, counterbalance. And, and is, is that so even in a free South Africa? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very that. much. Now, well, now I'll just also add one more because I see a question from Uyen Lu. Uyen Lu. Uh, a question for Scherto. Um, would you like to ask that? I don't know if. Yeah, I, I can. Um, I can stop my uh, video. So I. So That's you right. want me? I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yes. Uh, I could be. Um, more agree with uh, with Chateau Jill because I'm also a psycho um, social therapist and I know how uh, important it is to heal the wound. Um, but how can we reach um, the awareness uh, of a lot of people to know to um, how to heal the wounds before uh, they started to hate each other? So do you have any program for that? How can we join? How can we help to contribute to uh, any kind of uh, collective healing? Anyway, I'll leave you to think about that, Chateau, and ask Farai if you wish to respond. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I think the colonial attitudes are manifested are manifesting even in a more brazen way today, possibly than uh, during the colonial era. I think you heard of what happened in South Africa, in Marikana, in uh, it should be 2012 or 2013, when workers who were only striking for a living wage, uh, who worked before this uh, British company called Noni. I think it's actually London Minerals, which was shortened to London. Um, workers, 34 striking workers were gunned down by the South African police. It was like a movie when I saw it on television for the first time. I didn't think it was real that a national police force will use live ammunition to kill workers who are simply demanding a living wage. Then we crossed the Limpopo, we come to Zimbabwe. In 2006, we discovered what was touted as the biggest diamond found since Kimberley, Marange. And uh, in, on the 27th of October, 2008, the government of Zimbabwe deployed the military. They massacred more than 200 artisanal miners within a space of three weeks and many more were killed after thereafter. And the killings are continuing to this day. Why are they doing this? They want to create space for foreign capital. They want to protect foreign huh. Well, Farah is frozen and he may come back, but uh, we've got the point of what he's saying. Thank you, Farai. I don't know if you can hear this, but I think I'll move on to Sherto because we're nearly at the end of time. Yes, okay. Uh, um, like I will one. quickly, thank you. I'll quick, I know the run of time. I'll quickly touch upon three things. One is history education. The other one is education as a whole. And also I want to say something about the positive, uh, well, recognize the, uh, the important uh, contribution of people of African descent and also those so formerly colonized people, their contribution. So uh, in terms of um, history education, and one of the important um, phrase today is, let history inform us, not define us. 
that means we must um, look at history from that perspective. Okay. Now, public education do not always in, in, enable young people to, to develop the awareness of history of slavery and, and the sort of a black, bl um, um, black history week is not, it's not enough. This is what we've already heard in the public far cry to have more. But however, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, 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 there have been um, 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 initiatives. For instance, UNESCO itself has developed something called the General History of Africa. But um, for the first time, and, and also in, in, in the US, and I wrote to Ken that um, in the US, there is an African Amer Museum of African Museum, African American Culture and History. Um, I, had, I, I had a total breakdown when I was there because the beauty of Africa, where before the colonial uh, came in, the beauty of it, and the question it, it came to me when I had a breakdown was, what if, what if none of this had happened? Um, but the, it's all these um, history and uh, the, the history, uh, if we studied it, and, and the museum, museum contribute, museum around the world can contribute hugely about historical awareness and so on. We actually, we can see, uh, um, it, it gave us that experiential awareness. This should never happen again. So history education is important. I'm totally with you, Mike and others. And uh, there's another initiative. It's this happening in the US. For those of you who are not aware, there's a, there is what they call the University Study Slavery, USS Consortium, involving 40 universities, 40 colleges, and, and from both sides of Atlantic, or Bristol University is part of that. So they share resources and describe the role of slavery, racism in our, in our common histories. So to be informed is only a start. As I said, I think education system should also be changed. If we students only what they do is to pass exam and study fixed curriculum, there will never be the opportunity to cultivate creative thinking, cultivate that kind of human compassion and human consciousness, and also a sense of responsibility. So history is only a starting point. Education system itself has to change. Otherwise, education as it current stands will remain to be a form of colonization. Someone said, what about contemporary colonization? That is just a form of colonization. It colonized our future generation's mind. But in this process, I, I'd, I've said that in, in the UNESCO project we did, we identified lots of programs that initiated by people of African descent in both sides of Atlantic um, and really looking at active ways to um, celebrate, celebrate ourselves being, being people of color, celebrating ourselves of people of culture and of our particular heritage, but also actively play a part in sharing that, uh, extending that awareness with others. That will was, was solve that binary, the white superiority and, and, and the black inferiority. But all this in this process, and I think if, if I would say the last word is, we must actively resist and desist any form of othering, any form of dehumanization, even from our own mind. So when we do this, let's not keep any kind of binary, whoever is good for everybody, even just we're trying to um, express, express our own guilt or, 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 or sense of humiliation. Let's actively like trust building, Rob Cochran's project, active trust building, embrace that, be the person to embrace the next one so that we start with a dehumanizing relationship. Thank you. Well, that's a thank you, Sherto, for finishing on that note. Let us all see what we can do. Now, we've lost Farai, but we still have Letlapa. Would you like to give the last word? We've only got two minutes before the end. What would you like to say, Latlapa? Yeah, thanks. One has learned a lot, especially the last words said by Shato, that we must resist dehumanization, even from our own mind. As if she was speaking to my own mind. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone who's been with us. Uh, 
uh, this this uh, stirs up a lot. It's a huge subject, so we we can only touch on it. But but there's a passion and there's a a commitment which in each of us can make a difference in different areas, and that all adds up. So thank you for being with us. Um, may everyone have a good Hanukkah, a good Christmas, uh, a good holiday, and uh, we look forward to further events in the next year. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you're welcome to unmute if you wish and just say thank you to our guests. And, uh, Absolutely excellent. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you bye -bye for having me. Bye bye, Let's Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>